Hi folks, my name is Adam and in this video I hope to show you just why persistent homology is such a successful tool when used in topological data analysis and other areas. This should be accessible for anyone who has seen persistence diagrams before, but for those who haven't, there are several great videos in this series which cover persistence diagrams and can bring you up to speed. Now, to get straight to the point, the answer to the question of why persistence homology works so well in application has a very simple answer, stability. In this video, we will look at exactly what stability means. We'll look at how to quantify stability and we'll cover some important results, including a relatively simple proof of one form of stability. Now, by stability, I just mean the persistent homology is robust under a perturbed filtration. So two similar filtrations should yield a similar persistent homology in some way. We typically use persistence diagrams to visualize these similarities. And there are various pseudometrics we can define to quantify when persistence diagrams are similar. For the rest of this video, we will introduce some of these pseudometrics or distances and show just how they quantify stability. There are two very common ways to measure the distance between two persistence diagrams, both of which involve taking the infimal cost of moving points from one diagram to the other, introducing the critical line y equals x if necessary. The first of these is the bottleneck distance, which calculates the infimal cost of moving points in the L infinity metric, or the supremum coordinate shift of any point. The second way involves a collection of what are called Wasserstein distances. Here, the P Wasserstein distance calculates the infimal cost of collectively moving points in the LP metric. So it's the sum of shifting all points with respect to the P norm in R squared. I should note, however, that in many sources, this is often called the PP Wasserstein distance as this definition does generalize slightly. In practice, we calculate these distances by first overlaying two persistence diagrams. Here, we have one in red and one in blue. Then, choosing a hopefully optimal pairing of points close to each other on each diagram, where off diagonal points representing critical pairs of cells added in the filtration to generate and kill cycles, are allowed to pair with any unique point on the critical line. The bottleneck distance is then the L infinity distance between the strings of points paired on each diagram, whereas the P Wasserstein distance is the LP distance between these strings. This leads to a good question of why might we use one distance over the other? Well, on one hand, the bottleneck distance may be preferred because it's easy to compute and easier to bound. On the other hand, Wasserstein distances are larger than bottleneck distances, and so bounds on Wasserstein distances imply stronger results about how close infimal pairings can be. Bottleneck distances don't distinguish between cases where one pairing of points is far away from each other, compared to those where every pairing of points is far away from each other, for instance. Admittedly, these distances are difficult to calculate exactly, especially when points on each persistence diagram correspond to a different critical pairs, since we may not know the infimal choice of bijection in advance. As we can see by varying the height filtration of the graph on the left here, when the two peaks have equal height, the edges Y and Z switch which homology class they kill, one created by B and the other by C. It becomes more difficult to calculate the distance between persistence diagrams on the right as the filtration is perturbed, as this switching of critical pairs changes the motion in which the points in the diagram move and makes it harder to pick which is the optimal pairing. Let's step back for a second though. I'm trying to show you that persistent homology is stable under perturbed filtration, but in order for this to make any sense, we need to know how to measure the perturbation of a filtration in the first place. The answer to this comes by considering a filtration as a collection of sublevel sets of a sufficiently nice function, where if need be, we define the function by the index of the filtration at which a point appears. 
We usually want these functions to be tame so that persistent homology is finite dimensional and non-trivial only for a bounded time. Then, given the filtrations of sublevel sets of two tame functions, we measure the perturbation by the supremum distance between the two functions. This background now allows us to understand the first major stability result underpinning persistent homology, bottleneck stability. Bottleneck stability allows us to bound the bottleneck distance of two persistence diagrams by the supremum distance between tame functions creating their fil filtrations, where a small change in function only induces a slightly small change in the filtration and only a slightly small change in the persistence diagram. Bottleneck stability can be applied in a fairly general setting and is easy to compute, although the bound it gives is fairly weak owing to the relative weakness of the bottleneck distance. The next major stability result to apply to persistent homology was Wasserstein stability, which, well, requires a very strong hypothesis in only to place a rather pessimistic bound on only some Wasserstein distances. On the upside, we get a stronger stability result owing to the introduction of Wasserstein distances, but this is at the expense of widespread application and somewhat difficult calculations. At this stage, it may seem fruitless to determine a strong stability result in terms of Wasserstein distances, given how difficult it was to construct some form of Wasserstein stability. But fear not, for when there is a will, there is yet another discrete analog to a function defined on a continuous set. Motivated by applications, a lot of recent work has gone into studying the persistent homology of sub-level sets of monotone functions on finite CW complexes. A monotone function in this instance is one which increases on dimension so that the function on any cell should be greater than the values on the cell's boundary. We can evaluate LP distances between monotone functions by the discrete analog to the LP norm where we sum over all cells. We study monotone functions in this case so that sublevel sets are also CW complexes, and requiring the complex to be finite essentially gives us a discrete analog to the idea of a tame function we discussed before. And that brings us to our final, newest major result in the stability of persistent homology, cellular Wasserstein stability which yields a very similar result to the bottleneck stability, but now applies to Wasserstein distances. Cellular Wasserstein stability provides strong bounds on stability owing to the presence of Wasserstein distance. It's also easily computable as long as you have a good way of computing LP distances for large data sets, and only for a slight loss of generality on bottleneck stability. The proof outlined in the original paper is also remarkably simple to follow. The idea being to take a linear interpolation of two monotone functions and essentially ignore difficulties arising from infamously choosing bijections when critical pairs change. In fact, this proof method has also been used to prove bottleneck stability under the same hypothesis and simply by limiting p to infinity. First, starting with two monotone functions on a finite CW complex, we take a linear interpolation. Since the domain is finite, only finitely many times in this interpolation will new degeneracies of cells occur. So only for a finite number of times will critical pairs change. In our previous animated example, for instance, this occurs halfway through the filtration, where Y and Z evaluated to seven and a half and switch critical pairs as time increases, as you can see along the bottom row. Between consecutive times AI and AI plus one, where critical pairs change, the persistence diagrams represent the same critical pairs. So we can bound the Wasserstein distance between the persistence diagrams of the filtration of FAI and FAI plus one by the LP distance points move while representing the same critical pairs. In the previous example, again, this amounts to the LP distance points of the same color move in each half of the interpolation as seen in the, along the bottom row here. And by definition, we can relate points in persistence diagrams 
to the function values of their corresponding critical pairs. Summing over all points in the persistence diagram and using, a, and using an analytic result, we can in turn bound this by the LP distance between FAI and FAI plus one, which therefore bounds the Wasserstein distance between their respective persistence diagrams. By applying the triangle inequality to Wasserstein distances, then applying the bounds we calculated, and finally applying linearity of the interpolation, we arrive at cellular Wasserstein stability. Now, while bottleneck and cellular Wasserstein stability are successful at showing persistent homology is stable under perturbation, it is worth pointing out some limitations. First is to note that the bounds imposed are optimal without any further assumptions. So it is difficult to tell when two vastly different functions with vastly different sublevel set filtrations might actually have similar persistent homology. The very keen viewer, if they are not skipping to the end by this stage, may have noticed, for instance, that the bound imposed by cellular Wasserstein stability applied to the example we looked at before was actually double the distance between the initial and final persistence diagrams of the interpolation. Moreover, at the moment, we are unable to generalize these results much beyond the current hypotheses. One can use an algebraic argument to show that cellular Wasserstein stability extends to infinite CW complexes if the persistent homology behaves nice enough. But as of recording, we don't know how to show that persistent homology is stable under perturbation when it is not point-wise finite dimensional or for cases where critical pairs change for non-discrete times, like for every rational point in an interpolation. On the positive side though, since both results apply to finite sets, bottleneck and cellular Wasserstein stability are readily available in applications in TDA to show that many real data sets have stable persistent homology under perturbation, whether they arise from point clouds, grayscale images, time series, or elsewhere. And this answers our original question. Persistent homology works in applications because it is stable under perturbation from limitations of noisy data.